Hello, and welcome to a special episode of That Encyclopedia podcast, something of a format experiment, you could say, but as always, with your hosts, me, Jacob, and Will. Hello. This is sort of a blind article taster, if you like. I have read the article that we're discussing today, but poor Will has had all of five seconds to look at it by design. In fact, it was so spontaneous that uh, we both had originally planned to record a regular episode uh, today, but um, at the last possible moment, I pivoted and tried to realise an idea that we've been discussing for some time, Will, I think that's fair to say, and mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is now a, a test of this format. The idea behind it is that by having one of us be completely unfamiliar with the article, it uh, fosters a sort of um, call and response, Q and A, uh, host and listener uh, dynamic between the two of us. And we think it might lead to a more interesting discussion, um, but we'll see how it goes. So as you will have seen from the title of the video, the article of today's experiment is game book one word no hyphen had you heard of a game book before will yeah i've absolutely heard of a game book before i'm aware of a i think semi well known a couple of semi well known authors in the the game book sort of arena so i've never played an actual game book in terms of the the book format but i have on my phone a couple of mobile games inspired by the genre. Steve Jackson's Sorcery. I don't know if you've heard of those. Ooh, I've heard of Steve Jackson uh, because his company Steve Jackson Games is the publisher behind GURPS, the generic universal role-playing system which I have been reading uh, religiously recently. But I'm not familiar with Sorcery. Uh, what, mm. how, what's, what's that about? So... Um, obviously an adaptation of a series of game books that he wrote. Um, I'm really intrigued how it works in a book format, actually, because there's a, a fair amount of um, flexibility in the, the spell system in the game. But it's basically a text-based adventure with combat and spells, but with a, a nice little graphical overhaul to make it a nice little mobile game that you can play. So there's four of them in the series. I presume there are four books. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've just realized just now um, that Steve Jackson is also one of the two authors behind the Fighting Fantasy series, which is very closely mm. related to Sorcery. Mm. Is that Ian uh, Livingston? being... Yeah, Ian Livingston, who I, that's the name I associated with fighting fantasy, and I've just made the connection with Steve Jackson as well. It's blowing my mind. Um, so so what the is... idea of a game book, yeah, sorry, go on. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, exactly. What is a game book? <laughs> well, the knows. idea behind it is, yeah, um, I don't know what the correct verb is, to read it or to play it. I would say probably to play based on my experiences with them and also the fact that it's called a game book and not a book game. Um, but the idea behind it is you uh, are addressed by the book in the second person. So the book says, you know, you do this, you do that, you are this person. And you assume the role of some character. Typically, um, it's a, a character that you yourself spin up or at least whose abilities and attributes you spin up. Um, fighting fantasy, I think, through Steve Jackson Games, uh, uses uses a 3D6 system. And uh, it's sort of like D&D um, in premise, but the actual system is a lot more simplified so that it can fit into a, a, an easily accessible book. So maybe instead of the six abilities that you'll have in D&D, uh, &D, you'll just have two, maybe uh, health and stamina or something, or strength and health, something like that. And you read the book as you normally would from left to right at the beginning 
while you roll up your character, choose your items, uh, and introduces the setting. And then you have to make note of page numbers because you'll turn to the first page of the actual story slash adventure and it says you are uh, setting forth from this village to uh, uh, conquer Firetop Mountain and slay the evil warlock who has made it his home. And uh, it is not long after leaving the village that you encounter your first trial, the fetid swamp that rings the mountain as a natural defense. Um, you must consider carefully how you are to uh, conquer this uh, hazard. If you, you, you could either uh, attempt to fashion some sort of makeshift boat out of reeds, or you could try to wade through it, or slash swim through it, or you could try to walk all the way around the bog and find some dry spot to cross there. And then it will give you a series of uh, turn two instructions. So it will say, if you try to make a boat, turn to page 102. If you try to swim, turn to page 95. And if you try to walk around, turn to page nine or something like that. And so you turn to the appropriate pages and follow the story as presented there. Um, the ideal, uh, The ideal scenario being that there are several routes to victory, depending on the items you chose and the deci uh, decisions that you made. Although in my experience, particularly with the early uh, fighting fantasy uh, books, for example, um, they can be pretty damn brutal. Uh, it is really tough, almost impossible actually, because it's so uh, luck dependent on how the dice rolls go, um, to conquer a game book in your first go. Uh, because I think it's designed explicitly with the idea that you will remember the routes and the pathways that you took. And if you conquered it straight away, then there's no motivation to go back and read the other uh, branching possibilities. Um, I remember the, one of the first fighting fantasy books, possibly the first one, is The Warlock of Firetop Mountain. And um, towards the end, if you make it that far, there's just a horrific mage, um, excuse me, maze section where you just find yourself in this labyrinth and you're turning to page this and turning to page that and all the pages just say, ah, you come to a bend. Like, do you do you go back? Do you carry on? Do you go left? Do you go right? Turn to this page, turn to that page. And it was nigh impossible to get through it at all. And the only way I managed to in the end was by actually using it on my phone, uh, whether you, it's been converted to a kind of game. And uh, there's a map tab that maps your par uh, pathway as you go through, which was a big help, but um, we're beside anyone who tries to do that with just a um, piece of paper and a pencil. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, I'd say, as a way to, to consider trying this genre, if it's of interest, I think the sorcery uh, game, the first one, is, so just Steve Jackson's sorcery is definitely not as difficult as I've heard the fighting fantasy books uh, can certainly be. And in fact, I'd say I've played a couple of the sorcery games. They definitely build in brutality. I've not got past the third game myself, <laughs> and I honestly have no idea how it works, uh, how it was adapted from a book. Honestly, I won't give any spoilers, but just some of the mechanics in the game are quite interesting uh, and involve like the the process of uh, moving objects around or interacting with a map in a way that I would be really intrigued to see how it's been adapted. Uh, but yeah, so Sorcery 1 is not too difficult, although obviously there are still those uh, notorious game book scenarios where you know you have no real way of uh, weighing up a decision and you pick the wrong thing and then your head is put on a spike by a troll <laughs> just instantly yeah. with no means no means to stop it they, they can be pretty like save or suck as, as we say in yeah. TTRPGs like you make the wrong decision you're dead that's it 
Yeah. <laughs> no chance. So it's an interesting like style of game because I mean often it depends on people's personal preferences for for games obviously uh, but I think a lot of game design tries to focus on um, finding that balance between making something feel difficult without making it a, a brutal case of just you constantly dying in a game right because you're sort of creating a narrative where, where it's quite enjoyable to have a narrative where you feel like you were challenged but you could overcome the challenges um, but the nature of the, the, the classic game book style is um, I don't know if it's a ridiculous comparison to say it's a little bit Dark Souls like in that there's more of a focus on like you, you as the, the player will accept that you are expected to die several times so you're not creating a narrative first time where you like could deal with everything but you're sort of understanding like how one could have hypothetically navigated this fantasy world and just how brutal it is and how much luck you actually need to survive and become the hero at the end of the day yeah absolutely and i wonder how much of that sort of um culture if you like in game books um dates it because the um well actually the uh, the the very first sort of choose your own adventure novel as it's um sometimes called but i think that refers to a specific kind of um uh, or specific uh, series of of game books as opposed to the concept generically uh, the first ever game book was apparently a romantic novel called consider the consequences published uh, in the United States in 1930, written by two authors called Doris Webster and Mary Alden Hopkins. And it had uh, over a dozen different endings for the reader, depending on the choices that they made. And I'm very, very curious to see what a 1930s romantic novel has in the way of choices and endings. Yeah, I don't know how courtship worked in 1930s America. <laughs> um, but the kind of golden age of game books um, emerged in the United States in the 1970s and then in the UK in the 1980s. Uh, there was some crossover, but largely independent publishers, actually. Um, and of course, at the time, you also saw an explosion of this idea of your tabletop role-playing games, the most iconic example being Dungeons and Dragons D&D &D, um, which at the time in the early editions and their sort of uh, progenitors like um, Chainmail and things were explicitly designed to focus more on the if you like conflict between the, the, the GM or the DM who runs the table and the players who just bring their character sheet along in the sense that death was expected and it was not uncommon to turn up to a table, uh, not with your character, but with your characters, <laughs> plural, who didn't have particularly elaborate backstories because there were 12 of them. Perhaps 12 is a bit of an exaggeration, but maybe like six of them. And the idea was to see either how far you could get with a character before they inevitably died to some poison trap, or to see how many characters it took uh, the table as a collective group to beat the dungeon master's dungeon so it was inherently conflictual in that sense and as ttrpgs evolved they focused a lot more on the role play side of of role playing game and less on the game side um, so that now with something like uh D &D fifth edition excuse me um it's still a combat game at its core in that your characters ha have classes still and the classes have feats that are predominantly focused on combat but there are plenty of ways and plenty of rules that facilitate games without any combat at all and some groups prefer that um, but game books haven't really evolved in the same way because it's so much harder to i mean how would you role play with like yourself or the book it, it sounds almost um like a Sisyphusian 
task to me. Uh, so I think the books have sort of been outpaced by the tabletop role-playing games. Um, but I wonder if if there is a way to modernize and adapt them. I don't know. What do you think? I think there must be. I think that um, Steve Jackson's sorcery is actually pretty popular as a as an app, but also it was popular as an app, so it got ported to PC. So it's actually a PC game, which is an adaptation of a book. <laughs> so, mm. um, and I found it quite enjoyable. I think for for me, the the setting it it worked well in, although can work well in anything right you could work it, it takes it can take the place of a book you can play it in bed before you go to sleep you can play it in the airport when you're waiting <laughs> waiting for several hours um it just works and in fact this is i've been considering uh trying some other more traditional game book although i don't know if i'd need to put more effort into into tracking things but certainly with like mobile phones having or creating a, a single player t- sort of essentially text adventure but with um, a more modern style interface it does work and it you know we've got a little bit more flexibility with the technology to obviously you don't need pen and paper to keep track of your items and health and that so it's just very easy as a format to do in theory, in practice, uh, obviously I haven't seen <laughs> many others, so I don't know what the reason for that is. It's certainly something I've considered is how would I go about creating a game book if I wanted to write one? Because being able to work around, you know, all of the 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 branching, basically creating this branching narrative that you can bring things back together um that's the main challenge because if i'm being uh extremely critical i wouldn't say all of the the writing itself is necessarily top notch <laughs> in these game <laughs> books there's some, some interesting descriptions interesting choice of words but the experience uh comes from the experience it comes from like the the journey that it takes you on so it doesn't seem to matter quite so much so actually i think if it was possible to sort of understand how to write a good game book structure maybe it wouldn't be too difficult to write a decent game book it's just maybe it is because i've not seen that many but again i'm not super into the niche so what do you think I wonder if the successor to the game book, spiritually, um, if not mechanically, because as you were saying, like mechanically, uh, they're, they're, well, how impressive they are is based on how complex their like tree, their, their like directed rooted tree model is, where yeah. you can write a game book, not really with words, but you can say, well, you start here and then here's choice one and that branches into these two, which branches into these six and so on and so forth. And then you just write flavor text paragraphs that facilitate a sense of progression uh, in the reader. Um, But I wonder if spiritually the successor to the game book might not be something like AI Dungeon. Have you heard of AI Dungeon? I have. I have played AI Dungeon uh, a few months ago. I played a fair bit of AI Dungeon, yeah. Yeah, I have as well. Um, Not massively, but I dabbled in it a bit about uh, eight months ago I think and um, it was impressive you know like uh, it, and it felt similar uh, in theme to something that a, a game book might foster where the actual kind of law if you like the world building is not too important it just needs to be enough to engender uh, a sense of immersion so that the, the player can play And with something like AI Dungeon, the idea is you type in a prompt and a tag um, to the the engine, the AI. Um, It might be description or it might be action or speech, something like that. And it will generate a decently long chunk of text uh, in, in response. And it allows you to create your own story 
without having to actually sit down and write the majority of it. <laughs> um, you can instruct. You can either, I think, instruct the AI to to write something that has a certain ending, or I think you can instruct the AI to just continue as it sees fit. I don't know to what extent you could truly call it an AI. I think particularly recently that term has become more of a marketing gimmick than anything else. Like it might just be Markov chains, um, but it's impressive regardless of what's powering it. And um, yeah, I wonder if that might be a spiritual successor to the game book, the, the modern person's game book. <laughs> mm. I think it's definitely inspired by that yeah and it, it has a similar has a similar feeling but i feel like there are two two or more main um challenges for using something like ai dungeon to substitute the role of a game book um and the, the main reason i think people go to it the benefit of it is this like incredible flexibility that you have right if you're playing a game book and you're in a tough situation, you're going to be presented with a very specific set of options which you might feel doesn't reflect what you would want your character to do in a situation. And in AI Dungeon, you can essentially tell it that your character's going to do anything and it will happen. <laughs> the mm. limitations that I think... So I, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic about the capability of AI in the future to do pretty much anything so what I would be interested in seeing is an AI dungeon that is capable of creating some form of shareable narrative experience you know where you've got a consistent set of underlying things that are progressing in this fictional world in a certain way and you have a somewhat limited scope in the actions that you can take as a character, you know, like you're limited by the uh, context of what your character could feasibly do, but still have the flexibility of actually writing what your character does. So and the, the reasons I think that would be good is for two things. The shared experience is something that you can get from a game book, right? If I've played sorcery and someone else has played sorcery, then we can sit down and have a chat about it and be like, oh yeah, uh, this bit was interesting or funny or this bit was crazy. You know, you can actually have a conversation mm -hmm. about it, linking it to the events. And you know that you're talking mm -hmm. about an experience that was very similar between you. Yeah. Um, whereas if I'm like, oh yeah, I played AI Dungeon, uh, it, I, I can give you a very wacky story about an adventure I had on AI Dungeon, but it's not something that you'll necessarily be able to sort of live through and experience yourself. It's much more individualized. That's something I think that we can get around, but I think that's one of the flaws in it in its current form. And the other flaw is in the sort of consistency of a narrative and sort of a planned plot progression uh, because the way a lot of it has worked, at least last time I was using it, sometimes things can sort of go in, in pretty bizarre tangents and it doesn't, you don't really get the sense that there's any, uh, that any one particular outcome is happening, sort of, you don't have the, the sense that something is happening in, in the fictional world that you are having to interact with. It feels like you're sort of just throwing things in whatever direction you want, you know, a, a bit too much god mode, when uh, mm. a more restricted, more challenging adventure mode might be something that people would enjoy. That's true, you can't really lose at AI Dungeon, you just sort of continue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can, I, you can die in it, <laughs> but all you need to do is write a more elaborate prompt that allows you to be like, oh, I do this, but also I find myself suddenly blessed by the gods with the power to resurrect myself on the spot you know you could do anything <laughs> because there's no limitation to your character unless you were to put a lot of effort yourself into hard limiting your character at the start but I don't even know if AI Dungeon would like 
remember that and apply it consistently throughout the game. But I, I think it would be very interesting to have like a sort of um, module based thing with with flexibility in between. You know, as I was saying, if there's like a plot and a set of things that are happening, and you are you are set in that world with the freedom to to decide how you would act, that could be very interesting. <laughs> Hmm. Absolutely, yeah, um, and something that uh, links the two together maybe um, is the genre that they both sort of fall into. Um, I would say that both AI Dungeon and your uh, game books fall into this genre of interactive fiction, um, and a I know we discussed crime fiction in the <laughs> most recent uh, video, so this is almost another umbrella term of uh, fictitious works that... Uh, no, that makes it sound like the works of themselves aren't real. Of real works about fictitious events that enable the reader or player or whatever noun you want to use to mm, nudge the narrative progression in a certain way. And uh, we've seen it with game books. You have it most obviously with uh, video games or most video games that involve narratives in some way. Um, games, uh, some early kind of text games, I don't know, Colossal Cave Adventure or something. Um, it's sort of the, the bread and butter, but it's not uncommon now for kind of even AAA titles to have multiple endings in an RPG sense. Something like Skyrim has a set narrative that's pretty straightforward but the amount of uh, decisions that you can make in other parts of the game mean that the final product of the world can look very different uh, depending on how you've played through it something like the witcher 3 has three different endings ultimately um, and more if you consider the dlcs and so forth and even there was a ah uh, do you remember there was a a film-ish or TV series or something on Netflix recently? Was it like a special yeah. of Black Mirror? I, I've, I haven't seen it and I can't remember what it's called. I can't remember what it's called. Even, um, uh, yeah, oh, but even something like that falls into this this category of interactive fiction, really. Um, or was it uh, yeah. Bandersnatch? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't... Yeah, we haven't seen it, so we can't comment on it. I have. But the concept, I have seen it. Oh, you have seen it. Oh, okay. Yeah. How how is it? Oh, uh, it's interesting. I think they again, every format that you choose has its strengths and limitations. So I think the limitation that Bandersnatch has is obviously uh, they had to film, they had to write script and film and essentially produce multiple scenes that were dependent on like the viewer choice so that they mm. it's not as branching as you could easily you know squeeze into a book <laughs> because the budget mm. on every single option uh, is going to be much higher uh, it was an interesting experience though interesting experiment because there's not a lot out there like that so i would recommend it i mean it's not too long I, I presume that's also because of the the limitation of you know time and money. Uh, yeah, it would be interesting. Yeah, it'd be interesting to have like more of a, a a movie length or series length thing that works like that. But, yeah, yeah. Something that's mostly a mostly a film, but with kind of choice elements. Yeah. Um, or alternatively, any David Cage game. Um, mm. Heavy Rain. Detroit become human. Uh, is it Quantum Leap? Is that a David Cage title? Um, Quantum Leap actually, I think it's called Quantum Leap. In particular, um, has like filmed sequences with you know live actors and everything, uh, interspersed with gameplay. So that might be the the, the closest hybrid. Um, mm. Yeah. Well, I think we're, we're we're coming towards the end now, but I just wanted to share a few fun tidbits with you uh, yeah. about this article uh, itself before we, we wrap up. Um, firstly, it may interest you to know that all of these books, anything that fell into the category uh, of a game book was pretty much universally 
banned in the Soviet Union uh, <laughs> until its collapse <laughs> uh, in the early 90s. I'm not sure if there was a specific reason why it points this out or whether this was just an extension of general book banning in the Soviet Union. Uh, anything that came out of the West, I, I'm really not sure. Uh, but that was something the article wanted to stress, so I'd stress it as well. Um, and I also wanted to share that the company that facilitated many of the um, kind of original um, game books was called was a company called TSR, which made um, a series of uh, a series of game books called Endless Quest, and uh, the uh, and was and is probably better known with founding Dungeons and Dragons originally before Wizards of the Coast took it over. And there was another company called Ballantine that made a series called Find Your Fate. And I'll conclude by saying that Find Your Fate gets a bonus points in my book for making uh, game books that are not generic fantasy, which seems to be a, a major theme with all of these, right? Sorcery, fighting fantasy, um, Endless Quest, they're all sort of quite generic in their genre. Uh, whereas Find Your Fate had kind of tie-ins with established brands so you had indiana jones books and james bond books and doctor who books mm. that sort of thing um so that a little bit different as well in terms of flavor but overall i think that's the game book an interesting format experiment both for us and for literature slash gaming as a whole not in its golden age anymore but Perhaps it has some spiritual successes, and perhaps it will even have its own renaissance in the years to come. Who knows? Any final thoughts from you, Will? I would like to see more more excellent fighting fantasy equivalents, because, you know, maybe I'll play them. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next time.